Just because it's hard doesn't mean you're a failure. It doesn't mean that it's not going to bear fruit. It is really okay for something to take time and effort. It's so much less about talent than it is about commitment and consistency. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you overcome the challenges of making a major career change. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you figure out the steps you can take to move on in your career and make your professional ambitions a reality. In each episode, we'll be speaking with people who have an inspiring career story to share, learning from the brave leaps they took to pursue something new and helping you find the clarity, confidence, and courage to make your own brave decisions that improve your career and life. You can subscribe to this podcast by going to careerrelaunch.net, where you can listen to all the latest episodes and get more useful resources to help you navigate your own career journey. Today, my guest is going to talk about relaunching her career from being a senior vice president at a consulting firm to starting her own business and community. We'll talk about the importance of daily discipline and embracing the ups and downs of your career journey. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel segment, I'll share my own personal perspectives on how you can start gaining traction with your own goals. On today's show, I'm really excited to feature my friend and former colleague, Ann Tomlinson. Anne has spent the past 25 years working to improve how older adults receive the services and care they need. Now she's taken her health policy research and consulting to launch Daughterhood. Daughterhood's mission is to help women get smarter about caring for their aging parents by building a community around common caregiving experiences. She spoke with me from Washington, D.C. Okay, Anne. Well, thanks so much for being on the Career Relaunch podcast. And I'm super excited to have you on as one of the first guests. I would love to just start by having you tell us a little bit more about what you're working on right now in your life and career, just to kind of get us kicked off and understand what you're up to. Sure. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on the podcast with you. You know, to kind of participate in it as you launch all of these new initiatives is really fun for me. When I watch you give your TEDx talk, all of those points in your career that you're talking about, I was there. (laughs) I saw it happen in real life. You know, the last year, 2015, was a year of taking my day-to-day work life and really structuring it in an even more disciplined way that's going to take the concept that, you know, we invented last year and propel it forward in 2016. I definitely want to hear all about daughterhood. And I know that's something that you launched just recently. And this is all about bringing caregivers together and helping people understand the various systems of care and building a community around common caregiving experiences, which is really interesting. Before we get to that, I would love to hear a little bit more about how you got to this moment of working on daughterhood and kind of if you could take us back to a few of the turning points in your career that led you here. My whole career has been focused on this kind of role of being an analyst, a consultant, a researcher, you know, a policy wonk in Washington, D.C., working on healthcare and aging issues. And I love that. And I've always loved it. It's a great career. But there were a couple of moments over this, the last 10 years where I had this experience. I don't know how to describe it except as like the word tug. You know, you feel something tug at you. And it happened, I think, for the first time when I was, I was writing something for a client. And I got this feedback that I, you know, they said, you know, you write like a journalist. That's so unusual. And I thought to myself, wow, I really love writing, but I've never written for anybody other than a corporate client. I've never written anything other than memos and reports and, you know, analyses and it just, I felt this tug, like that, that's something I'd really, I'd like to try. Did you feel like you were a good writer before that? No. And that's the crazy thing. Had anybody told me in high school or college that I would be writing as a primary part of my job one day, I would have said, you're crazy. I'm not a good writer. I don't even get good grades in English. And I was like, I really never saw myself that way. And also it kind of came around the same time that I was asked to participate in this forum. and. Usually, again, usually the things I participate in are for the expert community. And instead, I was asked to come and speak to 
a group of women who were taking care of their parents or were being cared for. You know, toss back a few drinks and talk about these issues that come up around aging, caring for aging parents, being an aging woman in this society. And I was asked to be a speaker, not as a as an analyst, but as somebody who knows a lot about this topic, but brings a level of heart to it. That was a pivotal moment because I, that was, the tug was so strong. I just, I thought, I want to do this. How much time passed before you actually decided to make the shift? A lot. So that was probably 2008. And you, know, this is the thing about those tugs. You can ignore them for a long time. It's so easy to stay in what you're comfortable with and what you're already doing. I would say to people, you know, I really want to write a book. I really want to write a book for consumers. And I talked a lot about it. So you were actually thinking about doing it. I was thinking about it, but I really could not, for the life of me, get from that idea that I wanted to do that. What do you think kept you from doing it? I had no idea. That movement from a job in which I receive a salary that comes into my bank account every two weeks to I'm writing a book is a big leap. And I tried to do it. So I was like, I'm going to get up every morning at 5 a.m. and start writing the book. And I would start writing. Here's what I learned. I had very little patience or tolerance for that process of writing and scrapping and practicing. I wanted it to come out perfect the first time. So I would sit down and would it be hard and frustrating? I would say, oh, I failed. It was hard. So I failed. So never mind. And then that activity would just go away. Yes. Life is also happening at the same time. So, you know, I have young children. I do have a job with responsibilities. And then I got divorced. And I I think I've said this to you before. I mean, there's nothing like a divorce to really quickly help you understand where all of your biggest fears and self-doubts are. It's a very traumatic and big thing to go through. Was that when you started to realize you wanted to make the shift? No, no. You know, I actually was doubling down on my expert career at that point. That was 2011. And I, so basically the trajectory here was 2009. I was like, this is, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do it from between 5 and 7 a.m. every morning. And it's going to, I'm going to get it done in a year. (laughs) Uh So then in 2011, my marriage fell apart and I have to, you know, support myself solely and I'm doubling down on being a, an important professional person with a big title and a paycheck and a consulting firm behind my name. And part of what I was doing during that time was really, I didn't realize it was seeding the ground for the big change I'd make in 2014 because it was, I was learning about content development, content marketing, and I started doing a lot more writing and a lot more speaking in that context. Can you take us to the moment when you decided to leave that behind and launch daughterhood? In the fall of 2013, this is funny how quickly these things can happen, right? I was like, this is, I am 100% invested in this particular job at this moment in time. When it's happening to you, you do not realize what a blessing it is. But the organization that within which I was working was also undergoing all of these changes. And these changes were not consistent with where I wanted to go creatively with the product that I was in charge of. And I had been in the organization 14 years and the direction the organization was going in and the direction that I wanted to go in became intolerable for me very, very quickly. It was like the perfect storm because I, you know, I had basically had this dream. It was lying dormant. I had been developing my skills And now suddenly I had this combustible moment. You know, I'm not a big woo-woo person here, but I really, it's amazing the way in which when that happens, you get support somehow. And I think it's because, you know, deep down inside, you're, you're reaching out into the world and really kind of almost unconsciously asking for it. Because as soon as I... I had that combustible moment, you know, it was actually in a meeting presenting my vision And realizing just, you know, your stomach just sort of dropping out of the bottom, you know, this isn't where this organization wants to go. And 
that combustible moment, about a week later, you called me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, I'm launching this thing and I, I'm working with people who want to make a career change. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. Yes. Serendipity. <laughs> I was like, wow, what a coincidence. <laughs> and then about a week after that, I had a meeting with a really great colleague of mine who said, you know, it's funny, I'm looking for somebody to help me with something. So why do you think that happened that things started to come together? Was that just the universe kind of coming together. You mentioned you're not kind of a woo-woo person. What do you think made it work out for you to have these support mechanisms come your way? Well, I guess maybe I'm a little (laughs) woo-woo. So I didn't used to be, but this, it was too freakishly coincidental. And I want to, I just want to clarify something really, I think is so important right here, because I think you hear, sometimes you hear a lot of people who go out into the world and create new things, talk about this experience of having things move into place to help kind of shine the light on the path right in front of them. But that is all it does. (laughs) It only shines the light on the path right in front of you. It doesn't make it easy. Despite the fact that you called and despite the fact that I went out for sushi with my friend Gretchen who needed help managing a big project that was right up my alley and she needed it to be on an independent basis and it was perfect bridge. Nevertheless, 99% of my emotional experience during this time was fear. So it sounds like some of the pieces were coming together, but that most of the time, this thing was really scary. Yeah. What was the hardest part of making this transition then? I see this all the time now when I look at my friends who are employed. And this is not to denigrate being employed by an organization. Hopefully soon people will be employed by me. (laughs) But, um, But it's very hard to believe in yourself because you're not really being tested to believe in yourself. So when I made this transition, it put into stark relief the degree to which I had really very little confidence in myself. And so I spent those first few months really doubting and questioning myself. I mean, it was waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, who do you think you are? Oh, like the imposter syndrome sort of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. You are only as good as the organization that you were attached to. That was your identity. It's an identity shift. You're going from being identified with an organization that provides you all kinds of cover, no matter how dysfunctional it might be. Uh, Most organizations have dysfunction, but you have that, you know, that devil, you know, and then you're out on your own, creating your own income and the rubber really is hitting the road and you have to trust that you have what it takes. And here's the thing when I, now it's funny, I feel like I've crossed over to the other side and I often now I'm in the position of counseling friends of mine who are really talented, brilliant, amazing people. And I'm always shocked at how uncertain they are about making this same transition. And I, I feel like, I wish you could just see this the way I see it. You, you are going to be more than fine you know? Do you feel like, because I hear that so often from people when they kind of are looking from inside an organization, they want to launch off and do their own thing, that they're really afraid of it, which I was too and when I was in that situation. It's, it's really terrifying. Do you feel like people have to go through it to believe that it actually does work out? What do you tell the people when they are on that cusp? I do think there's a certain amount of going through it and it's really normal, really normal to be scared and nervous. But I do think that what I tell people is that it really does help to have a coach or a counselor. And the reason is because you are believing things about yourself. And you taught me this. There's that voice in your head that is trying to protect you, but it's very loud. (laughs) Right. So, you know, it's not reasonable to expect that you would be able to combat that voice by yourself. That's where you really need another person, a coach, or you need a community interacting with and engaged in talking to people who can be your voice of reason, you know, as you did with me many times, you know, kind of like, you seem to have a lot of evidence for why this won't work. Let's talk about the evidence for why it would. (laughs) So having somebody provide a different perspective to get you out of your head. Yeah, because I mean, I think there were a few really pivotal moments where I really was losing faith or confidence. And there was no particularly good reason for it, except that it's just really hard to describe how unsettling it can be to go from a 25-year career where you're getting a paycheck every two weeks to one in which you're not, and you're not married. What I would say to people is you will be shocked at how much you can do. 
on your own. You don't even know because you've never been in that situation. By going through it, you've actually been able to experience what it's like to trust yourself, to rely on yourself, to create something from nothing. Right. Now that you're farther along in it, do you still have those moments of doubt or does that come up as much as it used to? It really doesn't. I would say I spent a year really wondering where the next project was coming from and it always came. So for a whole year, it was like, oh, I got a project. It's going to give me this much money. That'll get me through the next three months. And right about the time that project would be over, in would come the next project. And and I should say, you know, so that was happening at the same time that I was really trying to develop the daughterhood concept. So the kind of the same thing was happening on daughterhood. How surprising was that to you to have these things continue to be in the pipeline without you having to necessarily go and proactively seek it out? I was completely shocked. So I mean, I would always be shocked. I was always, you know, I, I really did spend a year going, I can't believe people want to hire me. This is so great. When you say that you couldn't believe that people would want to hire you, what was making you think that? I think it was this shifting identity that I had something of value to contribute. I didn't realize how reliant I was on the organization that was behind me in my previous job. So there I was like, of course you want to hire us. We have a hundred smart people here. That there was something inherently valuable about working with me that people would be willing to pay for. It took me a year of continued evidence of it to believe it. And then I would just like to say, I spent another year still consistently undervaluing it. So I worked very hard last year because I didn't charge enough. And how did you overcome that undervaluing, undercharging? There was no choice. There's so much work coming in. After a year of this sort of like, what? There's work. That's great. And then it started to really come in. And I just, I got to, you know, fall of this year and I realized I cannot because I'm not charging enough. It's affecting daughterhood. It's affecting my kids. It's affecting my health. And and I can't explain it. You know, again, this gets back to the kind of woo-woo stuff. There's a chemical, an alchemical process happening internally as you're going through all of this. There are forces inside of yourself that start to shift. Like this moment, this ball where I thought, people will actually pay money just for me to give them advice. I don't have to produce the perfect product or paper. It's enough. I am enough. In what I, in the experience that I have and the, the knowledge base that I have and the, what I've been involved in. So, knowing what you know now, then, Anne, because it sounds like you now are at a point where you feel comfortable knowing that you have a lot of value to offer. What advice would you offer to the past Anne as you were making this shift into daughterhood? Just because something is hard doesn't mean that you're failing, it doesn't mean that it's not going to bear fruit, that it is really okay for something to take time and effort. It's so much less about talent than it is about time and effort and commitment and consistency. And that's where the magic happens. I mean, not to sound like Elizabeth Gilbert, but you know, it's, she's right. You know, you, it's, you know, it's the, it's that butt in chair every day. That's 99% of it. And it doesn't really have that much to do with you personally. It's just, are you committed? Are you all in despite your fear? And I, I once heard Mastin Kip say something that I actually wrote down and taped to my wall. He said uh, when he was starting out writing um, The Daily Love that he was living, I guess, in some suboptimal situation and, and uh, little tiny little room. And he said he heard this voice. So he's very woo-woo, right? But he said, you know, your faith is the size of this room. So it's a very small room. And then it said, but that's enough. <laughs> it's enough. Like you, don't need, you don't need that much courage. You just need a little bit of courage and faith and comfort in that place of not knowing. And then everything else is just showing up. Just making sure that you're putting in whatever you need to do each and every day, day in, day out, putting in the hard work Yep. and figuring out a way to make it happen. Yeah. You know, I think the advice I would give my, my earlier self would not be to do anything differently. It would just be to suffer less. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I don't have advice in terms of, I really feel like it's unfolded exactly the way it was meant to. I think I suffered more than I needed to. That actually is a nice segue into one of the last questions I've got for you here, which is when you look back on this career change, is there something you wish you had known that may have allowed you to not suffer as much as you just mentioned? You know, I wish that I had known just how amazing it is 
just to be in the process of doing something new. Because I was very goal oriented. And not that there's anything wrong with goals. Goals are great. But you know, my goals are like, will the launch the new business with, you know, X million in revenue by, you know, 12 months from now. <laughs> and it was all kind of like about getting to that end goal instead of being in that process that this is your new life, Anne. You better be really sure that this is how you want to live. And I wouldn't have done anything differently, but the job now is creating and building, always. The job is not, you know, I'm going to invent something and then that's going to be done. It's always a process of invention. That's the job. I wish I had known that because I think I would have used my time more effectively in the beginning. It took me nine months of you and a couple other people saying, just start. (laughs) But, you know, it's like, I can't start because when I start, then the clock is ticking. And now I understand there's no clock. This is what I do now. There's a painter whose painting started getting shown in her 90s. She'd been painting for 60 years. You know, you really have to love painting. What I wish I'd known was that this was about loving this process of doing this. I mean, it'll be nice if there's commercial success. It'll be nice if there's a scaling and an appreciation of the work and you know, um, but that's not why I'm doing it. But I didn't know that 18 months ago or two years ago. Two years ago, I thought it was about, you know, writing that book and getting it finished and off to the publisher and then spending the rest of my life in the Bahamas. You know what I mean? Like, I see. Yeah. I guess it kind of goes back to the the whole enjoying the journey along the way. Yeah. And I, I think as Tony Robbins talks a lot about not achieving to be happy, but happily achieving it, exactly. kind of enjoying the journey as you're going through it. And that that is in and of itself really gratifying. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for taking us through your journey and giving us an insight into some of those challenges that I know a lot of people go through when they're trying to make a big change. And I'd love to wrap up by just hearing a little bit more about daughterhood and how people can find out more about daughterhood. But before we do that, I got three quick questions for you just to wrap things up. And the first, is there a specific tool that you've used that has kind of helped you keep yourself on track? The one thing I do really recommend that everybody do is find, it doesn't matter how you do it, but you do need a way to keep track of your ideas because ideas do not like to come to you when you are sitting at your desk, I found. So inevitably I'm walking somewhere, you know, and I have to stop and pull out my phone and I just use my notes. The notes app on your phone. Yeah. And I just type in whatever phrase or idea or thought comes to me. And I think one of the most challenging things about this is that you will find the more creative work you do, the more creative work you will want to do. So you start bringing things into the world and it opens up some hatch in the back of your mind. So just be prepared. You don't have to follow every thread, but I have an idea book. I give every idea one page to express itself. And then I leave it there because then I feel less pressure to execute on everything. And that's how I keep some discipline. What about the best career advice you've ever received? Right when I was leaving, this mentor of mine, who he sat me down. He said, he goes, you're just going to have to get in the boat. Just get in the boat and start rowing. Just get going. Just start. I mean, you hear a lot of people say that, but it was really true. That was great advice. And then if one path doesn't work, you just go down another. There's no such thing as failing. You're not failing. You're trying. He uh, He said it was an army ranger, and he was in that ranger training that is so bleak. And all these guys washed out. And he said the only reason he stayed was not because he was big or strong or tough or brave. It's just because he would wake up in the morning and be like, okay, I'm just going to get up. I think that might actually have been the most valuable. When he's, I found that to be such a relief. Oh, you don't have to be brilliant. You know, you don't have to be Mark Zuckerberg. You just have to get up. I guess it goes back to how you said just showing up and just doing something, yeah. <laughs> anything each day right. will help you make some progress. Amazing how that will work out. And finally, so what's one habit that's consistently served you well in your career? I think it's a mental attitude of just not staying down too long. So here's the funny thing. I don't have great habits just in general. Okay. I have tried so hard to get get up early in the morning or uh, meditate or blah, 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 run, exercise, you name it, whatever it is. I I can't, I'm not good at habits. But the thing that that I am good at is deciding that, you know, whatever the setback is, I'm more committed than ever to moving forward in spite of and because of things that haven't worked out. So it's like a mental, it's like a mental process that I go through that just says, and maybe this is I me mean, harping on the same theme again. But it's just like, you know, just always get back up. Just get back up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like the theme from Rocky is playing in the background now, you know. Right. 
So with that music in the background now, I want to wrap up by talking a little bit about yes. daughterhood here. So you launched that, you're organizing these meetups and you're building more awareness for your community. And it's all about caring for aging parents. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the meetups and, and what you're focused on right now? So the meetups are a huge initiative of mine right now. I am launching a recruiting effort to get community leaders all around the country to start daughterhood circles in their local communities. We kicked it off in San Diego last year. It went really well and we learned a lot. And what one of the biggest things we learned is that it takes commitment and leadership at the community level in order to create community around this issue, but that it's really needed. It really is all about providing women with the information, resources, and support that they need to do this job, which is a hard one. And all these themes we've been talking about with starting your own business, you know, families' experiences, like this is very, very, very hard caring for another adult. And just because it's hard doesn't mean you're a failure. And that's our message. I think bringing communities together is going to help spread that message. So if there are women out there who want to get smarter about their aging parents or they want to learn more about daughterhood or they want to get involved with one of these communities, where can they go to follow you or to find out more? So go to daughterhood.org and you can subscribe to the newsletter, which would be really fantastic. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Facebook, though, is really where the community is coming together. So if you're in this situation, please, please, please come visit us. And I'm still small enough that if you know if you have a question, just write to me through the website. I love to hear from readers. I have a, a really kind of a fun and growing kind of Q&A with readers that I, that I really value. I, I learn a lot and love the interaction. Well, thank you for making yourself available to those people, Anne. And thanks so much for taking the time to share your journey with us and for telling us about daughterhood. And I just really appreciate you being willing to talk through not only the highlights, but also some of the, the lower moments throughout your journey, because that's, that's what we all go through when we're trying to do this. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Anne's thoughts on how to recognize when it's time to move on from your current job, the power of taking small steps every single day toward your goals, and how to manage the ups and downs of your career journey. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'll be sharing my own thoughts on the power of daily habits. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I'll finish up the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today, and then I'll wrap up with a simple challenge for you to help you move forward with one of your own career goals. So for today's Mental Fuel, I'm going to leave you with a few closing thoughts on one of the ideas Anne touched on, which is the power of daily habits. Then I'm going to finish up by sharing a free resource you can use to help you gain some traction against your own goals. So back in 2007, after finishing my MBA, I was living in San Francisco and I was working as a marketer for a large consumer packaged goods company. I'd been managing a long distance relationship with my then girlfriend, now wife, who had finished up her PhD in London and was working in Nottingham in the UK. So later I decided to make the leap out to the UK, but didn't manage to line up a job before making the move. So I left my job behind in the US and moved to the UK without a job in place. And it was my first time attempting to get a job in another country, and I had a really hard time getting any good advice on how best to approach this. So I basically did the one thing I could think to do, which was to dig deep and work as hard as I possibly could day in and day out to find a job. And I basically treated finding a job like my full-time job and committed eight hours every single day to job hunting or networking or outreach. And I forced myself to do three things every single week. First, I reached out to three people every single day. Second, I physically went into London three days every week to network. And third, I met with at least three new people every single week. Now, a lot of people never responded, but a few people did respond and a few people were helpful. And a couple of those trips were really productive. And within six weeks, I landed a new marketing job in a senior role at a great company that ended up being a promotion for my last job. So things ended up working out pretty well. Now, I'm sharing this story to illustrate a concept Jim Collins talks about in his book, Great by Choice. He talks about a concept called the 20-mile march and illustrates this by telling the story of two teams, identical in capability and profile, who set off to lead their teams to the South Pole in 1911. And to make a long story short, one team makes it and the other team perishes. And one of the differences was that the team that succeeded went 20 miles every single day. And on the good days, they didn't go more. On the bad days, they didn't go less. They committed to a 20-mile daily pace no matter what. Now, in contrast, the team where no one survived, they would sit around on the bad days and overexert themselves on the good days. 
and that pace became unsustainable. So this shows the power of taking small manageable steps every single day toward your goals. Maybe you're in a situation like I was where you've been working towards something and you feel like you're dealing with a lot of rejection or you feel like you're getting nowhere with your efforts. Sometimes you just got to dig deep, hang in there and keep working hard. Keep putting in your 20 mile march because you never know when you're going to turn a corner and when your luck's going to change. Sometimes it really just comes down to finding one person who's going to say yes. And this reminds me of a quote my sister Joan shared with me when I was in high school. Look at the stone cutter hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it'll split in two. And I know it wasn't the last blow that did it, but all that had gone before. That's a quote by Jacob Rees. So my challenge to you is to define your 20 mile march. When you think about the steps you need to take to reach your next big career goal, what's one specific action you can commit to doing every single day to steadily move yourself in a concrete way toward achieving your goal. If you could use some structure to help you define the commitments you want to make, you can download a free framework I created to help you do this at careerrelaunch.net slash episode three, where you can also find a summary of the key ideas and links mentioned today. While you're there, you can subscribe to the show or leave me a comment or question. I'd love to hear from you. That's careerrelaunch.net slash episode three. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Career Relaunch and a special thanks again to Ann Tumlinson for joining us today. This episode was mixed by Raid Sandtrack, Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu and I'll see you next time.